If you would, open your Bibles to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 4. A revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 4. Once you find your place there, I invite you to stand in honor of reading God's word. Revelation of Jesus Christ chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 7. Verse 7, talk, it begins with the four beasts and then into the 24 elders. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lived forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." Father, as we are to the preaching and teaching part of the service, Father, once again I ask that you would empty me of myself, Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin, and that you would fill me with thine Holy Ghost, that I may preach, thus saith the word of the Lord. And Father, I ask that you would help us this morning, or to, uh, to get what you have for us in your word. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I love you. I ask you to do all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. A couple of weeks ago, we started uh, chapter 4, uh, an open window into the throne room of God. This is part 2 of that. And so, uh, let's, let's, re let's rehash a couple things, some things that we discussed a couple of weeks ago because I know... Uh, it's hard for you to remember what was preached Wednesday night, much less two weeks ago. And so, even though I wasn't here, I still remember what was preached Sunday morning. And so, but let's look at, at the beginning of chapter 4. We, uh, we talked about how John was transported to heaven, that Jesus uh, told him to come up with uh, to come up there, and we see in verse 1 it says, After this, of course, after this, uh, talks about what happened in chapters 2 and chapter 3. Of course, uh, we hold to that the uh, that we are going to be raptured out of here between chapters 3 and chapters 4 because uh, the church is not mentioned uh, from after at the end of chapter 3 until the uh, end of the book. We know that the church is not mentioned, uh, and of course the 24 elders, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of that this morning, uh, they're not mentioned either uh, uh, after a while in the book of Revelation, uh, just for a few, just for a little bit of chapters, but John was uh, transported up to, to heaven and uh, to, uh, to show him what must happen here after talking about what's going to happen in the future. And uh, we see that immediately when he was transported in heaven, he was transported into one place. And what was that place? It was the throne room of God. We discussed that as soon as we as believers die, the first thing we are going to see is the throne room of God. Uh, I know it's nice, as we mentioned, it would be nice to, to go see our loved ones that have passed, maybe even children. But according to Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and also here in the book of Revelation, the very first thing place we're going to is God's throne room. And we discussed what John saw in what in the throne room. 
uh, we talked how he saw the uh, how he described God as a jasper, and a uh, because it was the most beautiful and valuable thing and that John had ever seen. Because remember, when John is describing this in Book of Revelation, just like Ezekiel did and Isaiah did, they're describing what they saw the best way they can. Right? It's the, uh, to their knowledge, to their limited knowledge of what they've seen and what they've experienced, they are, they are uh, uh, describing that the best way they can. And so that's why he described uh, uh, God as a jasper uh, stone and also a, a sardis stone. And um, uh, he also saw the rainbow that was uh, the emerald color, and it circled, it, the, that the rainbow went around the throne, uh, and we discussed a little bit about that, uh, what that symbolizes is that uh, we on earth, we only see a part of, the of a rainbow, and John gets to see the whole thing up in heaven, uh, he gets to see the whole picture, and uh, so uh, just some things that we discussed uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to continue the you know an open window into the throne room of God part two uh, continue on that we're going to discuss the four beasts and the twenty and four elders and what uh, what else going on there and so let's look at the first thing we have in, in verses seven and the first part of verse eight the four living beasts uh, I'll read it again uh, in verse seven it says and the four beasts was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf, and the third beast like the face of a lion. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And so the, let's look at the, uh, the, the describe of the four beasts. Uh, the first thing we need to look, understand is that they were located in the midst and around encircling the throne of God. And so it says that they were around in the midst of the throne of God. So when John sees this, when he's looking at the throne, he sees these four beasts uh, uh, that were, uh, they were circled around in the midst, they were circled around the throne. And not only did, they, did John see it this way, but uh, not only them, but we also... We're going to look in Ezekiel and Isaiah that they saw that he that them two saw the exact same thing. Not only did uh, they see the same thing, but uh, we see that also that in Ezekiel that he saw them moving. That Ezekiel saw the the movement of the four beasts around the throne. So let's turn to Ezekiel chapter one. Ezekiel and chapter number one is where we're going to be in. Ezekiel in chapter number 1, <clears throat> if you will turn there. Ezekiel chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse number 4. Ezekiel 1, verse 4, it said, And, and I looked, and behold... A whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber and not in the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. <coughs> and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and their soul, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they uh, sparkled like the color of uh, burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they and they four had their faces and their wings, and verse nine, their wings were joined. One to another, they turned not when they went, and went every one straight forward. As for the lightness of their faces, every four had the face of a man, 
and the face of a lion in the, in the, on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox, and on the left side, and four also the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward, two wings uh, to every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And when they went, everyone straight forward, whether the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. And or verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And so we see in Ezekiel, uh, he saw the same beast. He kind of describes them a little differently. We don't know when John uh, was, saw what he saw, that he only saw one side of them. But nonetheless, what Ezekiel saw, John saw. So we see that they saw the same things. They say they saw the same beast, the same four beasts. In Isaiah chapter 6, let's go to Isaiah and chapter number 6. And we'll look at what Isaiah saw. We're only going to read a few verses in Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. said, In the year of the king Uzziah uh, uh, died, I, I saw... Uh, also, the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and one had six wings, and w uh, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So, all three that saw the throne room of God, they saw the same four beasts. And so uh, that's what, how they were described. Now the images of the four, uh, uh, of the four beasts of, of and what or who they represent. So there's a lot of, I don't say misnomers, but there's a lot of different people think that these four beasts represent different things. Uh, some writers believe that the four beasts represents the, God, the four Gospels. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. Okay, I mean, you can look into it and how each Gospel uh, shows, and, uh, shows how they, uh, who Jesus is, and you could kind of dive into that and, and see how each one might represent it. Uh, but the Bible doesn't say so, so... We here at the Garth Road Baptist Church are not going to hold to that because the Bible doesn't describe it that way. And so, uh, but, uh, uh, but we, one thing we do know is what they represent is Isaiah described them as what? Seraphims and cherubim. So, they are, what they are is an exalted angelic beings. They are angels. I'm sorry. When someone dies, they don't become angels. I know it's a nice thought. I know a lot of people say so-and-so got their wings today. Uh, there's no Bible basis for that. Not trying to be rude, be mean, but no. Humans don't turn into angels when they die. All right, angels are already created and they're already numbered. All right, and so, but no, we don't turn into angels. But these uh, uh, these four beasts are are exalted angelic beings. They are uh, seraphim and cherubims of what, according to what Isaiah uh, chapter six, what he descri as he describes them, he names them as cherubim and seraphims. Not only are they the exalted angels, but they had privilege above all the other angels being that close to the throne. You can all, when we go through the book of Revelation, you will also see that there are other angels there in the throne room, but they're not as close to the throne as these four angels are. They, they're exalted angels, and they are privileged to be closer to the throne than any of the other angels. And, and the reason is because they have, some, they have specific jobs in the book of Revelation. Not only is their job to... Uh, to uh, 
uh, sing, you know, to sing and to worship God. But listen, uh, they also, one of their job is, they are associated with God's judgment on the earth. They are associated with God's judgment on the earth. Let's, let's turn to Revelation chapter 6, and you're going to see that uh, not only do they say, holy, 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 worship God, but every single one of them has a job in the throne room of God. And I want to let you know that when we get to heaven, we're not just going to worship God, but we also are going to be busy serving God. Because these four angels, they are serving God and in, in, in also uh, kind of associated with His judgment. Because in chapter 6, as John is writing a, a, about um, uh, God about to pour out judgment uh, with the seals... Let's look at chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, and I, saw, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering into conquering. So the, he had the, the first beast, uh, says, listen, you need to come and see, John. What's he, what's he doing? He's associating with the judgment, the Antichrist coming, because that's what verse 1 represents. That's who that is. That's the Antichrist. And so uh, not only does they sing, but they're also associated with showing God's judgment. Uh, chapter 6 and also uh, verse 3, and they're talking about the second seal, I said in and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out uh, another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat <coughs> uh, to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So we have the, the first two beasts, and the, then we have the third beast on the third seal, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And then also in verse number uh, uh, 7, it says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And we're going to move over into chapter 15 of Revelation, chapter 15, and verse number 7 where it says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden veils full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And also in verse 16, in verse, chapter 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and, put, and pour out the vows of, uh, of the wrath of God upon the earth. And so, not only are they worshiping God, but they have duties in the, uh, within the throne room of God. Uh, we see in chapter 6, as Jesus begins to open the seals, right? They're announcing it. They're announcing it. And so, they have jobs and, and duties that are associated with God's judgment. But not only were... Did they have duties? But listen, we need to also understand they were to vote. They were devoted to worshiping and serving God. They were devoted to worshiping and serving God. Because in Isaiah uh, chapter six, we see that they said, "Holy, holy, holy," right? And also in Revelation chapter four, we see that they also say, "Holy, holy, holy." And so, uh, listen, in Isaiah chapter 6, they show with their wings how God must be worshipped. And what did it say? With two they covered their what? Face. With two they covered their what? With feet. And with two they did what? Fly. So it shows that they're showing with their wings how God is to be worshipped. They are to, we, and also the 24 elders show us how God is to be worshipped. What do they do? They bow down. And so we, we, we see that, yes, these four beasts, they, uh, uh, they, had some, they had some specific duties that they did associated with God's judgment, but also uh, to, uh, they were devoted to worshipping 
God. So, but let's look at the their declaration uh, of the what they what they're declaring about God being holy. Uh, so we as we look in verse eight, we see it say, it says that and they rest not day and night, saying, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is, and is to come." And so day and night they offer praise to God. Listen. In, Ch- in, I- in Isaiah chapter 6 and in Revelation uh, chapter 4, listen, let me help you. Their song does not change. Their song does not change. They're singing the same thing. Now, now listen, the 24 elders, their song is different. It says they sing a new song. But the four beasts, they don't. Their song stays the same. Holy, holy, holy. They're singing about God's attributes, right? And so uh, their song never changes. God is worthy of this kind of praise. Listen, God is worthy of this kind of praise. Someone said, uh, they were talking about this over the week. It was in one of the pages, ministry pages I follow, that one of the teenagers came forward and said, isn't God, I can't remember the word they used, or no, they said, isn't God selfish? God is selfish wanting us to do this, because they were talking about saying God is uh, holy, 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 and deserving all the praise and worship, And, and one of the teenagers said, God is selfish to want this much praise. Folks, he deserves that much praise. He is the creator. He has ownership. And so, he is worthy of this kind of praise. And and let me kind of help you out. If you ever think that you've done so much for God that you don't have any more in you to give praise to him, no, he is still worthy uh, to be praised more. So these four beasts, uh, the uh, they their song doesn't change because why God is worthy of them to sing holy, holy, holy. Now it says it day and night. Now I want you to catch this. Does this mean that even though they are associated and have other duties, that they continue to sing holy, holy, holy day and night? And what about those other duties that they that we see in chapter six? Well, let me ask you this. They're not, they're not doing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have duties. It's, it's kind of like when Paul said to first, in 1 first Thessalonians that day and night that they preached and they, they did not want the church of Thessalonica to be responsible for them. He says day and night that they, that they preached. Did Paul preach day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No. It means that he had day duties and he had night duties. He did things during the day and he did things in the evening. Yes, but when, when these four beasts were not involved in doing their duties in, in the throne room of, and that's associated with God's judgment to come, they are at his throne moving about singing holy, 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 giving God... His due praise, because he is worthy of that praise. Holy, holy, holy sums up all of the attributes of God. When they, and not only when they sang the song of praise, the 24 elders also gave praise. So I don't want to spend a lot of time of what the... Now, remember, everything in, in, in Revelation, a lot of, especially in four verses, it has to do with a lot of symbolism, okay? And so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these four beasts. They're important. Uh, but let's look at the 24 elders. The 24 elders. <coughs> There's a lot of speculation of who the 20, these 24 elders represent. 
Some people think that they represent Israel. And we, can't, we don't see that because, well, Israel is also mentioned later in the book of Revelation, so they can't just represent Israel. There's a lot, and I'll say this, there's a lot of Bible teachers, uh, theologians, that believe that these 24 elders symbolize or represent the church. And the reason they say that is because, well, the church is no longer mentioned from chapter 4 to the end of the, chapter, uh, end of the, the last chapter of Revelation again, but these 24 elders are. And where are the 24 elders? In heaven, in the throne room. And so some believe that these 24 elders represent the church also because of their crowns, because of when, when we receive Christ, we get the crown of life, and we get... Uh, talking about winning souls and getting these crowns. And some believe that it's that. Listen, I don't know. God hasn't shown me that. Either I'm not smart enough, or God hasn't shown me that yet, and I haven't dove that far into it where he can show me that. But I just want to let you know, this is what some people think that these 24 elders are. Nonetheless, they still play a role. They still play a role in the throne room of God. And so, but whenever the four beasts give glory, honor, and thanks to God, these elders fall before God and worship Him. If, if you look, every single time that they do this, there are several times in the book of Revelation that these four beasts do this. What do the 24 elders do? They fall down. And they worship, they throw their crowns, they worship God. And so... Uh, they are worshiping God because of who He is. And they are acknowledging that He is the Lord God Almighty. And, and so it says, And when those beasts gave glory, in verse 9, and honor and thanks to Him that sat upon the throne, who, th upon the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before Him, that sat on the throne. Listen, when you understand uh, who God is, and you are thankful for God, and you honor God, you too will fall on the ground. Listen, if you don't fall on the ground uh, and understand uh, uh, His uh, being thankful to Him, and giving Him honor, and giving Him glory, if you don't fall on the ground to worship Him, you, my friend, are missing what worship really is. You're missing out. Because He is worthy of us falling on the ground and to worshiping Him. All right, and so, uh, listen, He is worthy of all glory, of all honor, and of all thanks. They acknowledge in their praise God's worth. There can never be be too much done for the Lord because He is worthy. And I know we talk about burnout. But we get burnout when we stop relying on Him. We get burnout not wanting to go to church, not wanting to serve God. We get burnout when we get our eyes off Him and we begin to put our eyes on this earth, on this world. I want to use an illustration. All right? Uh, if I could, I, I would like to get Brother Stephan and Brother Roy up here. And if you two could sit in these two seats. And if I could get Brother Priest, Brother Jason over on these two seats. Now, I want to give you what these... We have this group of people. This group of people are the Jews, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the temple. Okay? This over here, we have Jason. 
Uh, well, he, Jason's going to represent a ch the church. Okay? He's representing the church. And just for illustration, Brother Priest is going to represent Jesus. Because out of the four of these, this is about the only one I could see. All right, that, that could. That, all right. But listen, whenever we, as we're going through life and as we're in church, listen, over the last year uh, with, with uh, COVID and the different things that's going on, uh, what tends to happen with the, the, uh, the, the drop in of attendance, maybe even the drop of giving, uh, what this church tends to do is they're, they're not looking at Jesus anymore. We have a lot of churches that are looking to this. Do you see the problem that the church is having? Do you see it? Where they, where, where's he looking? He's looking over here. Where should he be looking? Over here. And what happens is when we get our eyes off of him and we start looking, I mean, we see we, John represents us greatly, when he, or Peter represents us greatly when he begins to sink, right? We see that. But in modern day, what happens is we start to get our eyes off of Jesus and we start looking, well, why aren't these, what's going on with these other churches? We're still seeing, uh, you know, these other churches are, are growing. They, uh, they're, they're still big. Uh, I mean, you look at their buildings and yet... Uh, and what are we supposed to do? We're not supposed to be looking at all the grandeur that's over here, but instead the church is to be looking back on Jesus. And when we get our eyes onto this and we get our eyes off of Jesus, praising Jesus becomes too much. Worshiping Jesus becomes too much. Uh, giving Jesus, giving everything to Jesus becomes too much because we've gotten our eyes off of Him and we get our eyes on, the, on this world and everything that looks good in this world. And when we get our eyes off of Him, what happens is Jesus ceases to become worthy in our own eyes because we start looking at our struggles. We look at what's going on in our own life and we get our eyes on this and that instead of Him. Church, we are to be the church Jesus wants us to be, not the church down the road. We are to be the church that Jesus, we are to do the work that Jesus has given us, not these other works that these other churches are doing. No, we are to do what Jesus wants us to do. We are to reach the people Jesus wants to reach. And by that means, listen, we have our own Jerusalem, which is Baytown. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus and stop getting our eyes on politics, on God. Government on this, on that, and stay our, our eyes set on Him. As I said Wednesday night, I'm tired of talking politics. I'm tired of talking about the vaccine. I'm tired. I've had enough. I've had enough. But what I am not, what what we, uh, it seems that churches are talking more about vaccine and COVID and this and that than we are about the goodness of God, about the greatness of Jesus, and what He is doing in each and one of our lives. Instead, we're more concerned of how COVID is and the effects of COVID is on our lives. Listen, the first century church went, fought, went through far more than we have with COVID. Well, Brother Mark, it's a real danger. I understand it's a real danger. But don't you think walking to uh, gathering together in the first century was dangerous? Well, if I get COVID, I could die. Well, let me tell you something. They could have died before they even got to church. Not only could they have died, but they could have cost the whole church their life. Did that hinder them from serving God? No, why? Because they didn't take it off. They didn't take their eyes off Jesus. When we take our eyes off Him, we quit. We quit.
the 24 elders, whether they represent the church or not, whatever the four beasts, whatever they represent or not, they show that no matter what, Jesus is worthy. Thank you, you all can come down. I wanted to make sure Brother Roy didn't fall asleep. <laughs> Folks, God has all creator rights over us and everything. He is worthy of all praise, all honor, and all glory. He is worthy. Get ready, church, because look what we'll be doing for eternity. When this heart ceases to beat and this body dies, I'll be immediately in the throne room of God. Why? Well, one, because I'm saved. But two, I'll be given my duties of what I'm going to do. I'll be worshiping Him, and I'll have my, my duties to do in worshiping Him. We're going to be doing the same thing that these 24 elders are doing. Worshiping God. My question is this. Will you be there? Will you be there? If you're saved, if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you'll be there. In the throne room, worshiping God. If you're not, you'll be at the throne room receiving judgment. You will be cast into the lake which, uh, which burns with fire and brimstone, which the Bible says in the book of Revelation, which is the second death. You will not get to continue in the throne room. You will not get to continue being with God. If you uh, neglect to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you continue to reject Him while you're on earth, you will live forever without Him in hell. <clears throat> will you be there to worship? Or will you be there to receive judgment? That's the only two options you have. Worship or judgment. And where you end up? To worship him forever? Or to be in judgment forever? All depends on what you do with Jesus. It all depends whether you will humble yourself And receive him as your personal savior. Give your heart to him. Put all your faith and all your trust in what he did on the cross. Because he died for you, he was buried for you, and he rose for you. So you would not have to spend eternity in judgment separated from God in hell. Where will you be? Living eternity in paradise with God, worshiping God? Or in hell, receiving judgment and damnation forever? And let me help you out. There's no party in hell. Listen, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm going there because there's going to be a party. The Bible gives us no indication but that it's pitch black and that you'll be tormented forever. There is no life after hell. It's hell forever. 
So where will you be? In a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to have, after I pray, we're going to have a time to, for folks that <coughs> God spoke to. They're going to be able to come to this altar here and pray and deal with whatever God has chosen to speak to them about. But if you're not saved, that will be the time for you to take opportunity to come forward and let me know that you're not saved. Let me know that you want to be. And we'll take the Bible. We'll show you God's plan of salvation, how that you can be saved and on your way to heaven and not hell. But it's a choice you and only you can make. Father, as we conclude this morning, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the warnings of your word. And Lord, thank you for what we have as a picture of what we're going, how we're going to spend eternity, Lord, in the throne room, in your throne room, serving you worshiping you or but for those that are not saved Lord I pray that they would take this warning that they would heed it that they would come forward in just a moment Lord and that they would allow us to show them your plan of salvation through your word so that they can have eternal life and live eternity in heaven and not in hell. Lord, I pray this morning that you've spoken to your people. Lord, that you've also spoken to those that are not saved. Father, may, we, may now they respond accordingly. And may you have your will and your way in the invitation. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.